and uh, invite Dr. Scott Kimball from Penn State University to join us and uh, tell us a little bit about mTOR, a very important protein involved in protein synthesis. Scott, please. Okay, thank you, David. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, yep, so good. my lab has been sending mTOR for, I guess, almost 25 years now. And one of the things we've been interested in is how, what the role of mTOR plays in, in regulating skeletal muscle protein synthesis and <clears throat> thereby contributing to changes in, in muscle mass. Um, one of the things that started me down this pathway was a paper that I read as a postdoc. It was published, I guess, 42 years ago now, um, where they used what they referred to as perfused Heinlein preparations to study the effects of different hormones and nutrients on muscle protein synthesis. So in these preparations, they cannulate the aorta and the vena cava, and then connect to peristaltic pumps so they can set up an artificial circulation. Um, and in this way, they can deliver hormones, nutrients, oxygen, drugs, whatever, to um, the muscles in the hind limbs um, by the intact vasculature. So in this particular study, what they were studying was the effect of different combinations and concentrations of amino acids on muscle protein synthesis. And what they found was that compared to um, perfusing the muscle with no added amino acids, perfusing with 1x amino acids, this is the concentration you find in the plasma of a fasted rat, there was a, about a 15% increase in protein synthesis. It wasn't statistically significant, but there was a slight increase. But if they increased the amino acid concentration to five times fasting levels, there was a significant increase in muscle protein synthesis. And that wasn't surprising because, of course, you need amino acids to make protein. They extended this to look at the effect of perfusing the muscle with 5x amino acids um, with no added branched chain amino acids. So the other 17 amino acids were present, but no leucine, isoleucine, or valine. And what they found was that instead of being increased, muscle protein synthesis was actually decreased by 15 to 20% compared to no, adding no amino acids at all. But in contrast, if they perfused the muscle with just the branched chain amino acids, protein synthesis was as high as if they perfused the muscle with all the amino acids. And in fact, if they perfused the muscle with just leucine, protein synthesis was as high as if you had all the amino acids present. So it suggested that the branched amino acids, and in particular leucine, were not only substrates for protein synthesis, but they somehow regulated the process. And so we decided to investigate this further, and we extended the study to in vivo, where we took a group of rats, fasted them overnight, and then in the morning we, perfused, we gave them an oral gavage of either saline, that's the yellow bar, or perfusing with just valine, isoleucine or leucine, and then measured protein synthesis um, half an hour to, to an hour later. And what we found was that leucine was able to significantly increase muscle protein synthesis, but valine and isoleucine didn't. So this again suggests that there's something unique about leucine. To get more information about how leucine might be acting, we took what was then a novel approach and that we gave the rats either vehicle, the yellow bars, or rapamycin two hours before we gavaged them with either saline or leucine. What we found was that in the control rats, protein synthesis was increased. It was also increased somewhat in the rapamycin-treated rats, but the effect was blunted so that protein synthesis didn't get any higher than what you saw in the fasted control animals. And this study has been repeated <clears throat> by us and by others, including studies in humans where Blake Rasmussen's lab has shown that if they treat fasted people with rapamycin, they completely block the effect of a, a mixture of essential amino acids that's enriched in leucine and muscle protein synthesis. So clearly mTOR in this, rapamycin is a specific inhibitor of mTORC1. It doesn't bind to mTORC2. So this suggested that this is um, the mTOR in complex one, mTORC1 is required for the increase in muscle protein synthesis. So <clears throat> we and others have been interested in how mTORC1 is regulated by leucine, and there have been a number of studies that have implicated various proteins that are involved in leucine signaling to mTOR. Um, the most recent one um, that's been studied is the, are the, the cestrin proteins. There's three of them, cestrins one, two, and three. And we and others have shown that they're necessary for cells to sense leucine availability in terms of regulating mTORC1. 
And so um, this is just an example where in the study we took <clears throat> wild type HEC 293 T cells or HEC 293 T cells in which the, all three sessions were knocked out using CRISPR and we incubated them either in complete medium, um, medium lacking leucine for two hours or medium lacking leucine and then we restored leucine for 30 minutes. In this case, what I'm showing you is P70 S6 kinase phosphorylation on 3 and E3 D9 because that's directly phosphorylated by mTORC1. But I can show you other um, data that were, let me see, similar effects. What we saw wasn't surprising um, in that leucine deprivation results in suppression of mTORC1 and leucine readdition to the medium rapidly restored mTORC1 in the wild type cells. But in cells lacking the three cestrins, there's no change in mTORC1 activity. And again, this is based on phosphorylation P70. It could also show you 4-EBP1 or other substrates of mTORC1. So you need the three cestrins in order to um, for mTORC1 to sense the availability of leucine. So another question we're interested in is why do we have three cestrins? Are they expressed at different levels in different tissues? Maybe they have different roles in sensing leucine. And one reason I say that is because Years ago, when we were doing these Kavage studies, we found that the response to leucine and gut in skeletal muscle seemed to be different than we saw when we looked at liver. And so this is just an example here. I'm showing you 4-EBP1 phosphorylation um, based on the gel shift where this, this slowest migrating form is a hypophosphorylated form and this upper band is a hyperphosphorylated. So in these fasted rats that were Kavage with saline, you see three bands for 4 EBP1. But 40 minutes after One, um, huh? after the um, after leucine gavage, you see almost all of it is up here in the hyperphosphoroid form. So you see this dramatic shift in response when you activate um, mTORC1. When the liver, most of the 4 EBP1 in the control conditions in this middle band, you only know, see a partial shift up into the this hyperphosphoroid form. And so you see different response in different tissues. For example, the brain, we don't see any shift at all when we gavage animals with, with leucine. So it depends on which tissue you're looking at and the, the magnitude of the effect of, of leucine on mTORC1. So the first thing we did was look at the expression of the mRNA encoding the three cestrins. And what we found was that in the liver, the three mRNAs are pretty much equally expressed. There's slightly more cestrin one than two or three, but overall they're pretty close. In the gastrocnemius, the most abundant mRNA is cestrin-3 followed by 1, and there's very little cestrin-2. Heart's pretty similar. Kidney and brain both have high amounts of cestrin-3 relative to the other two. And notice the scale on the y-axis. So in brain, um, this is 20, so there's a lot of cestrin-3 mRNA. In the liver, it's only about 1, and so there's a lot more cestrin-3 mRNA in the brain than, than these other tissues to see, get an idea of whether the protein followed the mRNA expression levels, we did Western blots. And so here's session one, two, and three in these different tissues. And in general, for a given cestrin, the protein expression was pretty similar to what we saw for the mRNA. So for example, in muscle and heart, session one mRNA expression was high relative to say liver and the protein expression was also high. And for session three, remember, there was a lot of cestrin-3 mRNA in the brain. It was very abundant compared to other tissues. And same thing for the cestrin-3 protein that's most highly expressed in the brain versus these other tissues. And I don't want to give you the wrong impression that if you look at this blot, you might think there's no cestrin-2 in muscle. But in fact, there, there is. It's just that the expression level is very low relative to, say, liver or kidney. So that um, this exposure, there's only a very faint band for, for gastrocnemius tibialis anterior. Um, if I overexpose it, you can see a clear band. So the skeletal muscle does express cestrin too. It's just it's very low expression relative to, say, liver. So this tells us the relative expression for these different um, mRNA, different proteins across tissues, but it doesn't, for example, tell us that there's more cestrin 1 in gastrocnemius than cestrin 2 because we're using different antibodies. And so what we did was we um, wanted to get a better idea of the amount of the cestrins within given tissues. So to do this, we expressed and purified the cestrins, and this is just a protein blot showing the, the purity. 
And then we use these pure proteins to create standard curves on a Western blot to which we can compare the signal for in, in a, within a given tissue to get a better idea of how much protein was expressed within that tissue. And this is just a standard curve showing the quantitation here. So we did that for each tissue in each cestrin. And then when we did that, um, this is what we found. So what we found was that for liver, cestrin one was the most highly expressed, followed by two and three. And the gastrocnemia cestrin one again was the most abundant. There was very little cestrin two in the gastroc, as you could tell from that previous blot. And I put an ND here because it just indicated this was below the level of our lowest standard that we used. Um, and you can see that in kidney and brain, the three stress and cestrins are more or less equally expressed. There's some variation. A couple of things to take from this slide. One is that um, based on the mRNA, you might expect cestrin-3 protein to be very abundant in brain, but in fact, it's more similar to what you'd see for, for cestrin-1, which suggests that the mRNA for cestrin-3 isn't translated as well relative to cestrin-1 and 2 as, as, as you might expect, based just on the abundance of the mRNA. Um, also, if you just sum up the amount of cestrin, if you had sum up the one, two, and three within a given tissue, and then look across tissues, the overall levels are actually fairly similar. So it doesn't seem like just the amount of total cestrin might explain the difference we're seeing in the 4-EBP1 blot I showed you a few minutes ago. So this led us to the question of whether the cestrins all have similar abilities to sense leucine. And so in order to try to address this question, what we did was take advantage of the fact that Amino acid linked mTOR requires this complex. It's five subunits referred to as Gator 2. Um, and so this protein is an activator of mTOR1. And in cells, it signals the availability of not only leucine, but also other amino acids such as arginine and methionine to mTOR1. So in cells deprived of leucine, the cestrins bind to Gator 2 and inhibit it. And so under low leucine conditions, cestrins act inhibit mTOR by inhibiting this Gator 2 complex. But when you add leucine back to cells, the sessions dissociate, and this allows the Gator 2 to activate mTORC1. So what we did was we expressed either this control protein, this, this is the methionine aminopeptidase, and one of the subunits of Gator 2, the WDR24. And a couple of days later, we incubated the cells with different concentrations of leucine. And we did flag pull downs and we blotted for the cestrins and also these other two subunits of Gator 2. And what we found is that it, the leucine concentration didn't matter in terms of the binding of MEOS and SEC13 to, to WDR24. So leucine didn't have any effect on the integrity of the Gator 2 complex that we could determine. What we saw is that some of the cestrins um, dissociated from, from WDR24 as we increased leucine concentration. And so by graphing this, we can calculate an apparent dissociation constant for leucine and for cestrin-1, we calculated it was about 60 micromolar. So this is slightly below what you see in the blood of a flat fasted rat. Cestrin-2 was much higher. It was 420 micromolar. So you can easily get to these levels in the blood of a rat that's been gavaged with leucine. But in a rat that's just consuming rat chow, um, you, don't, you don't usually see leucine concentrations as high. Um, what we also saw was that the, we didn't detect any dissociation of cestrin-3 from Gator-2, um, even at 300 micromolar. And we did another study where we extended this curve out to 800 micromolar leucine, and we still didn't see any dissociation of cestrin-3 from WDR24. Um, so this suggests that, um, that, at least in terms of binding to Gator-2, um, cestrin-3 um, doesn't isn't involved in leucine um, singling to mTORC1. But I mean, that's a pretty broad assumption at this point. Um, to see whether um, these findings we found in these cells and culture could be applied um, in vivo, we expressed the three proteins, the flag is flag tag protein, session one, two, and three, in skeletal muscle using in vivo electroporation. And so we um, injected the expression plasmids into the tibialis anterior muscle and then used these electrodes to generate a series of electrical pulses that caused the um, the myofibers to take up um, the expression plasmids. And this is just a control where we um, um, injected a plasma expressing GFP to show the efficiency of transfection. And so in these studies, we had one leg where we had 
um, the muscle um, transfected in one leg with the plasma expressing GFP, the other leg expressed this flag tag met AP2. Separate group of rats, we injected one leg with the flag tag session one expression plasma, the other with the plasma expressing session three. And then in the third set of rats, we had um, muscle transfected with session um, two or the flag met AP. Um, a few days later, we fasted the rats overnight, devised them with either saline or leucine, and then did flag pull downs. And um, then we blooded for these three different subunits of, of Gator 2. What we saw was that in the leg transfect with Cestrin 1, there was a decrease in Gator 2 in the flag um, pull down when the rats were transfected, um, devised with leucine versus saline. That's quantitated here. But for Cestrin 3 and Cestrin 2, there was no. Um, difference between the leucine gavaged animals and the, the animals gavaged with saline. So based on the abundance of the three proteins and um, the parents sensitive to leucine, we feel that Cestrin 1 is probably the predominant leucine sensor in skeletal muscle and perhaps Cestrin 3 might play a small role, but um, we're not sure how at this point. So I'd like to um, change gears for just a minute and go and talk about cestrins in a different role, and that's the role in us um, as, as cell stress sensors. So the cestrins were originally identified it's more than 10 years ago now as genes that were in upregulating response to various cell stresses. So for example, the cestrin one and two genes were upregulating response to DNA damage, hypoxia, oxidative stress, these are all conditions in which mTORC1 activity is suppressed. And so these proteins were identif originally identified as mTORC1 inhibitors. What's interesting is that these same stresses also induce the genes for RED1 and RED2. So this is regulated in development DNA damage 1 and 2. And so these proteins also inhibit mTORC1. And so what we we're wondering was what the relative role was of the cestrins versus RED1 and acting to suppress mTORC1 under different stress conditions. And so to give you one example, in this study, we had a group of mice that were fasted overnight, and then in the morning half of them were refed. And as you can see, mTORC1 activity was um, significantly increased after refeeding. But cestrin 2 and RED1 expression were decreased after refeeding, which suggests that maybe one or the other or both might be contributing to this desuppression of mTORC1. So what we did um, was we used a cell culture model that we've been using for a number of years. In this case, these are mouse embryo fibroblasts or MEFs that were deprived of leucine for different periods of time. And what we find is that shortly after we deprive cells of leucine, mTORC1 activity is, is suppressed. Um, again, this is phosphorylation of this P70S6 kinase on 3389. Um, but if you continue to deprive the cells of leucine, you actually see a reactivation of mTORC1. The time at which mTORC1 is reactivated depends on the cell type in, the, in these MEF cells. It's a, in the two to four hour range. And this reactivation is associated with an increase in autophagy. So autophagy, you're degrading proteins, releasing amino acids, and that it, it reactivates mTORC1. But if you continue the leucine deprivation even further, you get a resuppression of mTORC1. And so the question was, what's causing this resuppression of mTORC1, um, even though autophagy is still in theory producing amino acids? So to answer this question, we looked at the expression of cestrin 2 and RED1. Um, what we find is, is that at this longer period of, of leucine deprivation, say to 16 hours, again, an increase in both cestrin 2 and run red one expression, and that this is associated with an increase in expression of this transcription factor ATF4. To see whether this ATF4 is actually regulating the expression of these other two proteins, um, we compared well type MEFs to MEFs in which ATF4 has been deleted. We can see as in the well type cells, there's a resuppression of mTORC1 at these longer periods, 8 and 16 hours. Of leucine deprivation and the cestrin 2 and red 1 expression both increase. But in cells lacking ATF4, there's no resuppression of, of mTORC1, it stays elevated, and there's no increase in cestrin 2 or red 1 expression. And so 
the it, it, what this suggests is that ATF four is re, is necessary for increasing session two and red one expression that one or both of them might be contributing to the resuppression of mTORC1 activity. What's also interesting is that in the ATF4 knockout cells at the zero hour time point, so in the control cells, mTORC1 activity is, is significantly higher compared to well type cells. And this is associated with a decrease in red one expression with no change in session two expression. So we haven't looked into this by restoring red one, but it, it's possible that the, the decrease in red one expression we see in the ATF4 cells is contributes to this significant increase in mTORC1 activity just in basal condition. So to get a better idea of the contribution of session two versus red one uh, in this resuppression of mTORC1, we did a number of different studies. Um, I'm just going to show you one. Um, so in this study, what we did was that we created four different stable cell lines. So we took wild type MEFs as well as red one knockout MEFs. And then we stably transfected them either with control SHRNA or an SHRNA targeting Cestrin 2. And so we have four different stable cell lines and then we did this loosing deprivation. So you can see that compared to the wall type cells, you don't see any red one, which is what you'd expect since they're knockout cells. The SHRNA against Cestrin 2 is pretty effective. It wasn't a complete knockdown. Um, but we got pretty good suppression of, of Cestrin 2 using this SHRNA. And I, I should mention we've created actually three different cell lines um, with three different SHRNAs targeting Cestrin 2, and I'm just going to show you one today because of, of time. Um, so what we found was, in, again, in the wild-type cells, prolonged leucine deprivation, you see a significant decrease in, in um, mTORC1 activity, and this is associated with increase in Cestrin 2 expression and RED1 expression. In the red one knockout cells, mTORC1 activity is basally higher than you see in the control cells, but you still see a suppression of, of mTORC1. Of course, there's no detectable red one, but you still see an increase in Cestrin2. So this suggests, it, and I should mention, um, I won't show you the data, I can show it later if anybody's interested, but we don't see any change in Cestrin1 or 3 or red 2 under these conditions. Um, so what we're concluding is that Cestrin 2 is contributing to the decrease in temtorc one activity um, in the red one knockout cells. In the wild type cells in which we've knocked down Cestrin 2, there's initial delay in resuppression of mTORC1, but eventually you see it. Again, we don't see any, hardly any detectable Cestrin 2, but red one expression is increased. So it, so we're assuming that the, the decrease here is due to the increase in red one. When we knock out session two in the red one knock down session two in the red one knockout cells, at the eight hour time point, mTORC1 activity is actually higher than the control, but eventually it does come down. And this is associated with um, a re-expression of session two. To, and it's, it's interesting that the levels are similar to what you see in the control cells at the zero time point and the mTORC1 activity at the 16 hour time point, similar to what you see in the control cells at the zero hour time point. So again, overall, what our conclusion is, is both Cestrin2 and RED1 contribute to the resuppression of mTORC1 at these longer time points. So why do we need both Cestrin and RED1 um, expression to be increased under these conditions? Well, we don't know for sure, but it's possible that uh, it's because the red and the session proteins inhibit different signaling pathways. So red one is a well characterized inhibitor of the insulin the IGF one signaling pathway to mTORC one, <coughs> whereas the sestrins um, obviously um, act through the amino acid signaling pathway. It's possibly act through other pathways also, and we and others have shown that you need activation of both the hormone insulin IGF one and amino acid signaling pathway in order to maximally activate mTORC1. So either insulin or amino acids can stimulate mTORC1, but you, if you put both together, you get a significant increase in mTORC1 compared to either one alone. So we feel that one possibility is that the REDs and the cestrins are inhibiting both these pathways to um, basically act in a combinatorial manner to 
to um, activate um, or to suppress mTORC1. <coughs> so I've been talking about cestrin 2 and I told you earlier that muscle doesn't express much cestrin 2 It's very low compared to the other cestrin. So does this have any relevance to muscle? And that's something that we're addressing now. Um, one possibility is that in earlier studies, I guess almost earlier, at least almost 15 years ago, we showed that glucocorticoids in skeletal muscle and in L6 myotubes, myoblast, um, dramatically upregulate regulate red one expression. They actually suppress mTOR or red red two expression, but red one expression is is upregulated about 20 fold, and this is associated with the suppression of mTOR one activity. What's interesting? One minute. Scott. A similar phenomena for okay for um for session one. So um, session one mRNA is increased by dexamethasone. Session two is suppressed, and so the session three mRNA abundance is unchanged. And so this is pure speculation, but it's possible that glucocorticoids may be acting both through Red one and session one to suppress mTORC one. <coughs> so in summary, the sessions are differentially expressed in tissues and have different affinities for leucine. In skeletal muscle, we believe session one is probably the predominant sensor of leucine, just based on its uh, expression level and it's sensitive to leucine. And at least session two and red one have overlapping roles in regulating mTORC1 activity in response to stresses. And it's likely that session one also probably acts with red one in a similar manner. So I'd just like to thank all the people past and present whose work I've talked about today, to thank NIH for funding, and I'd like to thank David again for the invitation to speak here today. Scott, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, let me, uh, let me get a question from the audience. Dr. Adagoki says, uh, <clears throat> in aging, does the abundance of cestrins and or their interactions with Gator 2 change? Could this explain the reduced effect of leucine on protein synthesis with age? Yeah, that's a really good question. We haven't looked at that, but other studies have, have looked at it. Um, some of them, cestrins weren't the primary target. They were doing these gene screens across aging. Um, and if you look in the, you know, the, the supplemental data, the, the data, the session, the session mRNAs at least decrease with age, at least session one does. Um, and, and so it, it definitely could be that with, with aging, the decrease in sensitivity is because session one um, expression has, has fallen. So that, that's, a, that's a really good, um, good question. And I don't think anybody's looked at that, the cestrin protein levels, you know, with aging, like re-expressed it to see whether that restores the sensitive mTOR to leucine. But, um, but yeah, no, that, that's a good question. Are the cestrin antibodies uh, reliable these days? I re remember a few years ago, we tried to do some cestrin work and struggling with those antibodies. And it's great to see your success here with cestrin. It really is wonderful work. But I wondered, uh, are there some reliable antibodies that are available? It, yeah, it depends on the set. That's, some of the session antibodies are definitely better than others. And even um, with it, for a given um, supplier, different lots, some work better than others. Um, so like the session one um, antibody seems to work really well for us. The session two antibodies, we usually screen a couple of different lots um, to find the one that works best. And the session three is also fairly, fairly well. So it, it, it depends on the cestrin target you're looking at and, uh, and the, the lot of antibody. But yeah, they, they've definitely, some of the antibodies have definitely gotten better. And uh, for cestrin two, I, I think the, the antibodies are, are the, maybe the least reliable. You, you, we definitely need to, we, we always screen different lots when we're, we're looking for a good cestrin two antibody. Yeah, right. I wondered if you could quickly summarize the role of ATF4. We were interested also in ATF4, and you, okay. you you had some nice data there. And I wondered, just briefly tell us, remind us again about what, what ATF4 is doing to cestrins and, and RED uh, and how that plays a role. Okay. Um, you can go back. Yeah, let's see. So, um, Maybe just keep back. Uh, no, we need to keep going. Okay, right here. Yeah. So ATF four um, has been shown in the past to be a transcription factor that upregulates red one. I mean, we've shown that, and other people have shown that 
also. I mean, there are other transcription factors that will upregulate RED1, but ATF4 is, is, is one of them. Um, and so under like ER stress conditions, uh, amino acid deprivation, things like that, where you increase ATF4 expression activity, you typically see an upregulation of RED1 and also other genes. Um, we also find the same thing now for Cestrin2, um, where when we, in the cells lacking ATF4, we don't see this increase in Cestrin2 expression. So for, for RED1, it looks like ATF4 may have some role in basal expression of RED1, just because in the knockout cells and the control cells, it's, it's lower, but we don't see that for Cestrin2. Um, it's, but it does seem to be involved in the increase in session two expression um, when we do this prolonged leucine deprivation. Um, so why that is, we don't know. It's, it, we think it's because other transcription factors are regulating session two and that they control the basal expression of session two. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I think okay. so. It's interesting. Thank you. I guess we better stop there. And uh, if anyone has more questions for uh, Dr. Kimball or for the other speakers, please go ahead and use the chat box. Uh, right now we have a 10 minute break.